This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Dr. Abby, you are like you are my my most anticipated guest well you're my only guest for today but i have been looking forward to this conversation since we first met a little while ago i think all of our listeners they're going to love you um i love the subject matter today but before we just dive into it before i just like throw us both into the deep end like a drunk at a pool party um yeah tell us a little bit about your background who you are okay uh well sounds good well i'm uh avi ratnanason uh, my current role and title or one of the labels i carry is founder and ceo of nhs which is a company that's in uh consulting it and um and training but uh fundamentally um my, who i am I, I suppose i i i grew up in in malaysia in in, in asia and uh, started my career as a doctor in the UK, uh, in the UK National Health Service, and uh, and then evolved into management. I worked with large companies like Pfizer, where I was chief of staff in Australia, and then turned into an entrepreneur. Um, you know, about 12 years ago, I started my first digital entrepreneur journey um, in the film and video space, and then came back to healthcare uh, with my current company, NHS, um, and uh, really have been trying to change the world one person at a time uh, by changing the mindsets of leaders and the decisions they make and the impact they make in the world. That's a, What that's questions a come to mind when you say that, again, before we just yeah. really dive into our subject matter? So yeah. you're, you're with the NHS, and then you go into Pfizer. That's, yeah. that, that, that's different than becoming an entrepreneur what led you down that road and and, and what about leadership what happened there yeah why, why, why yeah, working it, with the leaders it is it's really interesting because i asked myself those exact same questions many times <laughs> over the years and uh, you know it kind of clicked when i watched that you know that interview with steve jobs you know at stanford and that speech he made at stanford is you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect the dots looking back, you know, and, and what he was talking about is that journey of life and purpose and, and why you did what you did, and how that has led you in, in some way perfectly to what you're doing now. All I can say is, that, you know, at the time, uh, it was always my lifetime ambition to be a doctor that was kind of, you know, job preference number one, uh, throughout, you know, from from when I was a kid. Um, and so, I, I grew up with that intention and I achieved that objective. You know, I got into medical school in the UK. I got a scholarship to do that. And then I, I, I ended up fulfilling that dream of becoming a doctor. And then when I was doing the work, um, you know, I kind of realized, well, there's this is a lot of this is fulfilling, but there's some parts of me that I'm not really using. Right. And uh, in, in school, I was good at math. And and some other subjects, but I, I never really used that, um, and in in um, in my clinical work as a doctor, and there were there were pieces missing in, in myself, and and so I, I I didn't know what they were at the time because I was too young, and you know it was my first job, and I couldn't I couldn't articulate what that was, but then I kind of went back to, I said well. I have this interest in business and management. For some reason, I was always reading the financial news. Uh, and business news all the time, you know, it, it, throughout my younger days. And I said, you know, we're missing. I don't really know what it is, but I know I like this business stuff. Um, I don't know much about business other than, you know, out of interest. Why don't I go back to school and learn uh, about this? And so I went to university and I did an MBA, a master's in business administration. You know, I, I went I went back to my default. List. I know I know I can study stuff. And I can learn stuff well. So my default is if I don't know something, let's go study it. 
And so I did this M MBA. I got I got an honors. I, I got a I got an honors, uh, and I and, and it was a two year degree that I completed in sixteen months. And I got I got an honors, uh, and it was a very tough time for me because I I, I didn't have much cash. I was very loaned up because I had used up a lot of well, <laughs> loans to get you were a to student. medical school. <laughs> yeah, I was a student, and and the medical school is five years, you know, so. It's 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 a long program, and then you got to do your houseman year, which is the sixth year. And I hadn't paid back my loans yet, and I was thinking of a you know thinking of doing something else already. So I went to business school, and I found that I was excelling in every single subject: marketing, mm -hmm. um, finance, um, you know, kind of all these different variety of subjects: change management, strategy, things that I knew nothing about before. I was excelling, you know, like honors, 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 and I'm like. Maybe I've done something right here uh, for myself because I am getting good at this stuff. I am good at this. So lecturers were telling me, Avi, you're going to be a captain of industry one day. You know, And I'm like, what is this captain of industry? I don't even know what that means. But they, they, they kept saying that. And, and, and so, yeah, soon after I left, I, I, I one or two jobs later, I got into Pfizer. So there was something I did right, but I didn't really know I was doing it right at the time, if that makes sense. Now, there's, there's so much there. Like a lot of times when you don't really know what are your unique areas of core competence, what are the things that pull you toward it by nature of interest? And, and also, what are the areas where a lot of other people, most people struggle through, but you seem to get it faster? It's almost It almost looks like it's intuitive to the outside observer. And even though you're investing a lot of work, a lot of times it doesn't feel like work. It feels like play. The other thing yeah. that I've noticed in this conversation so far is all day I've been saying stupid things. I've been misexplaining things, getting things incorrect, just because it's been one of those days where it, it's been it's been a week where I haven't had a lot of sleep and I'm kind of tired. Yeah. And I, yeah. I asked such a stupid question in the beginning of this podcast. Hopefully that'll be the last, but no guarantees. Well, tell us a little bit about who you are. There's not this one unified you. There's so many facets. So you have this yeah. dream about becoming a doctor. You get there. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is cool, but it's incomplete. Yeah. Yeah. There's this other part of me, this unrequited part of me that yeah. needs to express itself. And, and, and you found from what I'm hearing, these two sides, of you really merged. So, so yeah. that's where the entrepreneurship came in. It's like, I get to combine and integrate two important yes. parts of me yes um yeah i mean look and I, I didn't even know i was consciously doing that at the time because you know at that stage of the journey bobby we're talking about just two parts i'm now at part 11 i think mm -hmm. you know yeah. and and you know and it's like um uh, you know it, it nailed for me once when i heard this quote from from deepa chopra and when he said you know, as soon as people put a label on you, or as soon as you put a label on yourself, you immediately limit yourself. Mm. Right? Because yeah. we as humans have this, you know, infinite potential that we underestimate. And and we define, but our identity is so important. And for males, for men especially, that identity association with our career is a big part of our identity. You know, mm -hmm. our job and our title. Is, is very important to our identity, you know? And so, but we put a label on that. And as soon as we, let's say, lose that job, either through a layoff or we lose that job because we get demotivated or de-interested or we realize it's incomplete, doesn't fully satisfy us, we can go into a bit of a crisis mode, a mental crisis mode, you know, because not only are we in a job transition, but we start to lose identity. You know, and there's a, a big self-reflection required to come out on the other side. Yeah, and I think I've, I've one experienced of the, that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure so many of us have had, and and particularly during the pandemic, many people experienced it, right? Because they were forced. That was it was forced upon them on a mass scale, as opposed to individuals kind of doing it one by one. But I think through that, what I've learned because of this this transformation. I've had to go through time and time again. I've learned how to do it quicker and faster. I think, as you point out so cleverly, but I've also learned the tools that you can use to now 
help you get there faster. You know, and we talked a bit about the Ikigai tool. And and at that time, I I I sort of around 2012 came across the Ikigai tool. Um, it wasn't really a tool, it's really a, a framework of how you find your purpose. And the Japanese call it the Ikigai, as you know. And it really was that convergence of what you love doing, what are you good at, um, what is the problem you're trying to solve in the world, and how can I make money from this? Mm -hmm. And that central point is the is the ikigai, right? Right. So I, I so think that that actually break it, it breaks down into like iki is life and, and guy is value or worth. When you put that together, it's it's it, it's what is your life purpose? What is your bliss? Right. I think yeah. that's that's so powerful when we talk about all the the parts of us and, and how yeah. do we make sense of them. That's right, because we have so many parts and we've created so many labels from the from the parts or aspects of us. You know, being a a father, a son, a brother, a, a, a friend, a doctor, a, a CEO, a, an executive. Uh, a DJ, a DJ as well, you know, and it's all these parts and labels that 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 we identify with, but they, they all represent only a small part of us. And so the Ikigai, you know, helps you expand that. So you're creating value, uh, more value in the world, as much value in the world as you possibly can from your, from all of you. But at the same time, you're extracting value for yourself as well. And then like that, that sort of extraction can be, or, or receipt, can be in the form of cash, a salary, an income, a bonus, uh, a, a sale, uh, or it can be in a non-cash form, right? Which is fulfillment, love, enjoyment, camaraderie. And these are all the other things. It's a, a sense of belonging and connection with other humans. These are all the things we get from our, our jobs, our workplace, our so hobbies. Are you saying that when you are clear on your ikigai, you can then start to conceptualize how does all the parts of me, all the roles that I play, whether it's husband in what, or friend or you know executive, how do each one of these help me express my highest values, my life purpose? And that becomes that becomes the commonality, that becomes the funnel that makes sense and directs all of it, if I understand yeah. it correctly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, it's a compass, right? And so many of us, when we are lost, we need to go back and look at the compass. Um, and the thing is, we many of us never um, built or, or bought the compass, right? We just went through navigating all the different parts of life. And they don't teach you this in school, right? This is like the most fundamental thing. And no, I was definitely wonder, not. Yeah, yeah. I often wonder if I was 18 and I did the Ikigai before I went to university, would I have chosen the same course? Mm. You know, would I have got to the same degree? Would people now do um, the same, make the same decisions that they made? Now, I have no regrets looking back because everything I've done has really led me to deliver such high value on the on the planet and with organizations and with leaders that I'm working with right now. Um, but I do question whether, you know, if, if I had done the Ikigai consciously, you know, would I have got here faster, right, um, and, and, and save a few years. Now, the thing is that um, uh, obviously it's, it's, it's not taught in school and in, in, in even universities, um, uh, but it is so critical to, to who we are, right. And, and the thing is the compass keeps moving when we change our location. Right? Just like any compass, the arrow keeps changing because we build, we grow, we learn new skills, we adapt our consciousness. So Ikigai shifts. evolves over time. Ikigai evolves over time. That's right. It One does. of my favorite quotes is from Charles Baudelaire, the French essayist, where he says, get drunk. This is the great imperative. If you do not want to feel time's horrid, fatal bruise upon your shoulders, grinding you into the earth get drunk and stay that way. And then he goes yeah. on to say, on what you ask on wine, poetry, virtue, doesn't matter. Just get drunk. And it's like, when you find that thing that is intoxicating for you, 
and you drink from it incessantly, I think like that's the key to living a life of bliss. And I think that when he talks about get drunk, that's ikigai. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing that you drink from that makes life intoxicating and, and a little bit more bearable, a little bit less painful. How do you go yeah. about finding that? Because I, I, I think at some level, if I'm not being too romantic about this, we're all yeah. searching for our ikigai. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I think the search continues over time. And I, it's so interesting, you know, when we talk about Ikigai evolving because it, it, it changes over time. It, it evolves as you learn and go through different life situations. And I'll give you an example, um, because particularly on this issue of getting drunk, because I used to get drunk a lot on, on alcohol and I, I'm, I'm sober now, uh, you know, and I've been sober since 2015. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Um, and, oh, no, mate. Thank you. I, I was just, uh, you know, and I get drunk on my my work, my ikigai and, and all that purely. But um, and, and there's so many parts to it as well. Family, love and, and so on. But what I wanted to come back to about this concept of getting drunk was um, helping a, a kind of a, a community of people. Um, let, let me step back a little bit. So at the time that um, around 2015, uh, whilst you know working through Energes, uh, which is my company, and doing the work there, that was fulfilling me, and so on and so forth. On another part of my life, I was going out at night in the evenings. Again, this is the other aspect, right? So you've got your your, your nine to five, let's call it that, and then you've got your social life. And you know, I was going out, I was socializing with friends. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's it. And, and you know, I was I was going to clubs and bars and all that, you know, and uh, and and obviously, you know, getting drunk and waking up really late in the afternoons on a Saturday, uh, you know, having lost half my Saturday uh, just because of a hangover, and um, and then and then finding that you know I probably wasn't performing um, as well as I could, and also that I probably wasn't uh, hanging out with the best people to help me grow as part of that as well. But my health obviously was getting severely impacted to times of stress because when I was getting really stressed in the business, I would go and drink some more, right? And sometimes up to yeah, like yeah. a bottle of wine a night on my own while sitting in front of the laptop, mm -hmm. crunching through stuff, you know? And, and then one day I was just kind of sitting on the toilet and just, it was just all blood in the toilet oh right? okay was, wow that's shit. <laughs> it's like i'm like really holy shit this is not this is not good what's going on so anyway i got some medical attention uh we managed to sort things out but really it was a big kick up the backside around scary health, really really like you've got to look after your health properly and no I, pun I, intended either absolutely and it was like no you know let's let's you know you can't keep doing this going really hard at work and relying on toxins to keep you going, you know? And at that, that time I was even smoking every now and again. So so I went through that journey of looking at this and I'll come to my point in a second, but really in, in doing that, that, that piece around, well, how do I stop alcohol, which has been such a dependence for me for 20 plus years, um, you know, and this is such a behavioral part of my lifestyle. I, I, I stopped alcohol, then found there was this gap. Uh, I had no... I, Saturday mornings come along and I've got nothing to do because I used to be hungover at that time, right? I've got this gap. And so I had this interest in music. I started learning, you know, taking DJ lessons and, you know, I've been, I've been DJing, you know, for the last eight years or so part time. But what it, what it kind of, and I do sober DJing. So what I do is I bring together these events that bring people together to dance and have raves without alcohol, right? And and it was quite a phenomenal change for them. And during the pandemic, people who are struggling in their homes, I was able to do these raves online. So even I had 70 year old women and one person was an amputee and she was dancing on the couch, raving during these raves, right? And, and she was wow. in Scotland and she was a, a psychotherapist and she was so isolated over there. But this gave her that, um, connection that passion that energy and 
I have found it, but that's part of my ikigai too. So energy and community and bringing people together yeah. in a way that's highly constructive, like without the alcohol and without yeah. the molly that usually comes with raves and like that yeah. environment to where just, just just the enthusiasm about the music and the people and the belonging yeah. draws people in and keeps people engaged in a powerful experience. Yeah. And I suppose well, my, 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 it wasn't part of my formal career, is the point, right? It wasn't part of that Ikiga, that part of the Ikiga wasn't part of my structured, you know, kind of nine to five job. It was something else that evolved through my social health journey that also became part of the Ikiga, if that makes sense. It wasn't sort of planned in the, in the core nine to five, right? And you see that a lot now, yeah, since the pandemic, everyone's got a side hustle. Right. Why has why everyone got a side hustle these days? Right. Yeah, I don't I, I don't think it's just financial. It's it, it's yeah. it, it's where the great resignation came from, yeah. where I think I yeah. think there's a lot of causes around the great resignation. I, I hate to make things too oversimplified. There is yeah. an integrated dynamic to everything. But I think some people sat with themselves so long to realize my soul is screaming, kind of like yours was. There's something else in me. That's yeah. really not being expressed. I just gave a webinar uh, not too long ago before we got on this call. And people talk about goals and habits around, well, I'm doing this, I'm eating this food, or I'm drinking this amount of alcohol, and I want to stop. How do I go about doing that? And that's that's fine. That's great. But what I think we don't consider often is what's going on in my identity and my environment that's driving that. And sometimes mm. I, I, I think it might be where we're not pursuing our values. We're not living our values. And that creates these massive voids. So we start yeah. doing things to distract ourselves, whether that's yes. with food or or with drink or, or anything, yeah. or, or, or throwing yeah. ourselves into work in a job that doesn't fulfill us. So we have all these yeah. distractions mechanisms mm. you know yeah 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 no absolutely and i i still until this to this day kind of um one of my big solutions for stress is still food mm -hmm. and sometimes not good food, not good nutritious food and and i think it's a big coping mechanism for stress as you know and and when we look at you know, we, you know, particularly in the in the healthcare industry, and and, and people from medical backgrounds, and we talk about, uh, and I was just doing a, a video about this uh, around the three countries that I work in the most, or, or live in the you know, U.S., Australia, Malaysia. Two thirds of the population, more than sixty six to sixty nine percent of the population, is overweight or obese. Okay, That's... in the countries that I'm and the most thing, right? Two thirds, so majority. Shocking. Right? It's absolutely crazy. And why, why, <laughs> why am I in these countries? And why is that happening? And I, you know, big part of it is is also is also, you know, we talk when we medicalize things, we talk about genetics, we talk about, you know, uh, uh, sort of social predispositions and all these things as well. But one of the things is, you know, we we lead stressful lives with a lot of challenges, and food is comfort. Mm -hmm. You know. Food is comfort, and in, in, in cultures like Malaysia, you just you eat all the time. Food is easily available. In cultures like Australia, you know we have lots of fatty foods. America, again, similar kinds of big, big problems, right, around that. It, it, but it, it's, it's an emotional correct. connection to food, right? Mm. That that we have, right? It's 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 an emotional crutch for us, like the alcohol and toxin, and and, and so. That also causes a lot of challenges in our lives. It's one of the, what you're saying right now. Just it, it hits upon something that frustrates me in coaching and behavior change. Where what you'll hear most of the times, if you listen to like a lot of podcasts, it's like, well, people eat like this, and you know, it's because they're weak and they're lazy and they don't have discipline. But you're talking about people that sometimes are working 80, 90 hours a week. They're doing yeah. extraordinary things that that a lazy person would never even come close to being able to accomplish. But there, there's more there. We're, yeah. we're, we're not 
just overeating, we're self-medicating. We're trying to change our yeah. emotional state from one thing to quite another. Because you never hear this. You never hear somebody in the office on a Monday going, oh my God, I totally blew my diet this weekend. I was eating so many Brussels sprouts or like I just overdid <laughs> it on the broccoli. Like why is it that we're always going for these ultra processed, highly palatable foods that are extremely high in sugar, in fat, in, in sodium? Well, one, it's it's the abundance of availability. Two, it's cost effective. So that price point makes it even more accessible. But I think we're not reaching for the veg. We're reaching for these foods because of the tryptophan uptake and the synthesis into serotonin. We're trying to yeah. change the state of our brain. There's a reason yeah. why we keep, if somebody comes back and goes, oh, I so overate this week, I blew my diet. Well, that's all. That's a whole different podcast. You can almost imagine the foods they're talking about. They don't even need to keep going. You can imagine what categories they were belong, they belong to. Yeah. And you got to look at the biochemistry of the brain to start to understand, oh, wow, this could be the product of quiet desperation. Yeah, and and that uh, serotonin release, which is that sense of comfort that many people get, and I get even now after a long hard day's work, and and I'm doing better. I have my own dietitian and so on to help me, but uh, and, and personal trainer. But I still fall into those those moments. I think one of the things that's helped. And remember, now I don't have cigarettes and alcohol anymore, right? Uh, it's it's so food is predominantly. My go-to and sometimes unhealthy food of you know too often unhealthy food uh but that changes with time and it changes with the environment that i'm in what i wanted to kind of add to that like coming back to the ikigai is you see the you know you know victor frankel and everyone knows that book man search for meaning you know when he was this doctor who was in the um the um the uh nazi camps uh, way back when during the Holocaust, and he observed the survivors. He observed the patterns of the survivors and what made um, the Jewish survivors survive compared to everybody else that didn't survive those camps. And what he found was that those people who found meaning in what they were doing every day within the camp or had some kind of meaning of what they wanted to do when they left the camp and had a purpose around what they do left, tended to survive much better than those people who had no meaning at all, right? And so when you go through, and so what the conclusion there is when you go through some kind of suffering, but you can connect that with meaning, you tend to be more at peace with yourself and look at it as an opportunity to grow and, 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 um, and transform. Now, let's bring that into today's world, because that was something that happened a long time ago, and one could argue hasn't happened again. But we brought that into nurses during the pandemic. And I don't know if you realize, but more nurses died than doctors during the pandemic. Right? Talk about that. Because in the process of care and, you know, mm -hmm. through transmission and, yeah. and so on. And so we, we found many, many nurses were suffering and we wanted to do something to help them through it. And so... For, for some of them, the goal that we could reach, we uh, delivered this program and within it was um, the, the Ikigai. And what was really interesting is some of, there was one nurse, I'm, I'm just going to call her, uh, actually, she's openly, this called Diana. Um, she was a senior nurse, about 20 years experience working in uh, the um, intensive care units and so on. And she did the Ikigai. And, and at the time she was burning out, she was frustrated. There was too many patients coming in. There was huge overload. She couldn't manage her junior nurses because they were also, you know, crapping out basically, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because of the workload and so on. And she did this, the, she did the program, the Ikigai, and we don't know how it was going to go. We did not know how it was going to go. And and she she did it. And then she came back and she chatted to us and she said, you know what? After I did that, I realized that, yeah, this is a terrible place. It's really hard and everything's, you know, it's so hard to manage the patients, ourselves, and so on. But this is what I chose. This is the profession I chose. I chose to be a healer. I chose to be a nurse. I chose to help people in hard times. And I am exactly where I need to be, you know? And that reframe um, helped her see the meaning in what she was doing every day and eased 
the suffering that she was going through. And she was, remember, she's a senior nurse, 20 plus experience, which then helped her coach all the other nurses under her through that difficult time as well, right? So, so that whole reframe and finding that meaning is so powerful for anyone when they do it, because when they can connect that ikigai to the challenge that they're going through, it sort of helps them go through a growth curve and, and ease some of that suffering, right? Alleviate some of that stress and discomfort. No, sometimes not just some, but quite a lot of that stress and discomfort because you connect that with meaning, you know, to you know. that that is so powerful. And, and sometimes when people are struggling and you talk about things like purpose and bliss, it seems a little bit tone deaf if someone's not there. And they're not connected to it. Oh, how could you talk about that? You don't understand. But if it, if having a sense of purpose can create a compass and a way forward for someone who is a nurse in that situation or someone who is in a concentration camp, it is yeah. arguable none of us will experience anywhere close to that level of suffering and adversity, thankfully. I, I think you know, in Man's Search for Meaning, I think it was one out of every 28 people who went into the concentration camps made it out. Hmm. 27 out of 28 died, either because they were executed immediately or they yeah. died in the labor camps. And yes. to, to have that power to hmm. give resilience and meaning and allow yeah. us to persevere is one thing. But even in day-to-day -day life, how many people experience, not happiness, we experience happiness. I watched something on Netflix. Oh, that was funny. I'm so happy we watched this. Big deal. But I'm talking about enduring joy, even in moments of suffering. I mean, you said, Victor Franker said that despair is suffering in the absence yeah. of meaning. So yeah. what then is... <sighs> What then is suffering in the presence of meaning? I think that is passion. Yeah. The, yeah. What we love so much, what gives us so much bliss, we're willing to suffer for it. Like that nurse yeah. was willing to suffer for it. Yeah. How do people go about identifying their, their ikigai? I know that's a really hard question because it might be different for everyone, but what would you recommend? So, I, I think that's, you know, because I, I went through this and figured this out. And like I said, we, I, I keep doing it for myself and also do it with my team, you know, in, in my organization, um, is that there's a tool for it. You know, there's, a, in fact, you can just type it into the internet. When I started doing it in 2012, there's the, the Venn diagram with the four quadrants that you could find on the internet. No one, no one had written a book about it as far as I could see back in 2012 and then books started being written about it and a few authors have written about it in 2012 i wrote up a a little four-page pdf here's how you do your ikigai and i just called it the ikigai toolkit i didn't have time or the mental capacity to write a book because i was so busy and 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 but i just put it up as a free resource on our website you know because i kept getting people coming to me CEOs, doctors, executives, managers, um, moms, dads, and you know they were all lost for some reason. <laughs> they come to me and they're like, you know, it was like, oh, you know, we're that doesn't struggling. surprise and, me at all. Yeah, you know, it's just like I'm struggling with my work, or I'm struggling with the family, and I'm struggling with this, and I'm trying to figure out what job I do next. I'm not very happy where I am, and almost all my prescriptions. Uh, you know, <laughs> would be do do your do the icky guy, and I've, I've written this up because I kept getting so many requests. I wrote it up as a free tool on the website. Just do this, download it, and inevitably, you know, I, I, if I would see them, you know, weeks or months later, they would say, "Oh, you know, when you when you when I did that thing, I did that thing," and they can't, they can't even remember the name sometimes. Uh, and, you know, it just changed my life because. I quit that job or I started this one or I continued on that job, but then I, I grew and I expanded it and I, I loved it a lot more. And, and, you know, oh, those and, are massive all... shifts. That's, that's not inconsequential by any measure. That's right. And, 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 um, 
and, and in some cases, you know, I'd come in and a you know, bank would call me to come and do a workshop and I'd just do it for a whole bunch of executives or a whole bunch of entrepreneurs and you do it in one hour, man. One hour to change your life. You know, Isn't it's, that it's, interesting? You yeah. were chief of staff at Pfizer. You are an accomplished doctor. You've got your MBA and people are like, would you come in and work with our people on life purpose and bliss, which is a business initiative. Because like yeah. when you're there, your, your your ability to form relationships, to collaborate, to be creative, to innovate, all the things that are critical to sustaining yeah. value within yeah. your organization, all of that magnifies. You become yeah. so much more of who you are. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the things that, I found over the years and, you know, I've kind of consulted now to um, executives in, you know, five or six countries, about, a, you know, a couple of hundred organizations. Um, and and this was one of the fundamental things I found, you know, whether you're consulting on improving their patient experience or customer experience or employee retention or optimizing their return on investment and finance, profit margin, Whatever it comes down to, there is always a leader. And then coming back to your earlier question around how is this linked to leadership, there's always a leader that uh, wants to instigate change, mm -hmm. right, and improvement. And if you if without the, with it, with, without the absence of that leader or that champion, the change cannot happen. The improvement cannot happen, right? But what if we go down to the deepest root cause? Uh, and this is why I, I put the Ikigai in my, my book that I just, uh, you know, have written around people's strategy. Um, if you go down to the mind of that particular leader, why do they want to make that improvement? If you really sit down and speak to them at a level, they will say, I need to do this as part of my role, duty, sense of fulfillment here in this organization. It's my purpose to bring this change to this or this improvement. If you really, if they really open up to you, they may say, I'm trying to improve the return on investment. They may say, I'm trying to improve patient care. They may say, but eventually you'll get to a point where they say, I have to do this. Like they go. Well, a lot of times you, you have to, if, if you don't, if you're, if you're that leader in orgs, I've seen this happen with CEOs, where it was a CEO yeah. that was the visionary yeah. change agent. And yeah. you get a ton of resistance typically. Like you think, yeah. oh, CEO, that person can institute. No, not not, not at all. And and yeah. you kind of have to create that link between the bottom line and what you're doing for people to kind of go, oh, okay, well, we'll give this a shot. So yeah. it, it, you've got that dynamic. You know, I, I know, I know a, a good friend of mine that took a job as CEO, did not need the money, did not need the job at all, because he saw the organization as a tool to help yeah. people like the whole anthem of the organization. He called it the originating intention was you can have what you truly want and all the resources and tools that that company offered. He wanted that as a pathway for people. So, but yeah. obviously he had to sell that to everybody in the C-suite on the executive team and yeah. people, people in the field, they loved it. But it wasn't such an easy sell as you got to higher yeah. positions within the organization. Yeah. How do we get a hold of this tool? Tell us about your website. Give us give us your web address. Right. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, the website is um, uh, www.energest.com. So E-N-E-R-G-E-S-S-E.com. And there's a section on resources. So if you click on the, the resources tab, there's a whole bunch of free resources, white papers, and so on. And the Ikigai tools right at the top. You just click on that and you can just download the, the Ikigai toolkit, which I wrote up. Simple, you know, kind of four-page PDF, which will take you through the whole exercise. And if you don't remember what um, Dr. Abby just said, just look in your show notes. It's right there. Okay. Thanks, mate. And then, and then you know... Um, the other place that um, the other thing that we're doing, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, is you know we've written up a book, which is called uh, People Strategy and Workforce Optimization, which is also on the same website. And that book has an eight-step methodology for what we call 
strategic HR planning. Now, that might sound like a very technical term, but it really is about how do you drive that improvement for your people overall, right? And improve the profitability of your organization in the process. So we've got an eight-step methodology to do that. And why um, I wanted to write that book, uh, which is actually the first book I've, I've released, um, is because once that leader finds the ikigai and the purpose and want to make the change, they still need a step-by-step -step process. And how do I introduce this to my whole organization, mm -hmm. right? And get everyone on board and put the right things in place, use data, use what they call the voice of management, the voice of employees, the voice of systems, triangulate that, identify the priorities, and then execute and embed that. So that's the purpose of the book. And it's particularly um, important right now, Bobby, because the world is going through this economic decline in a lot of ways, post-pandemic, right? Many companies are in um, this kind of revenue shortfall. They're having to lay off, you know, we've seen the tech sector lay off thousands of staff from Twitter, Microsoft to Amazon. But you've also got a whole bunch of industries that are acutely short-staffed or they don't have the skills in place, right? Hospitals are short of nurses, right? I deal with some of the, some big players and some very small organizations, short-staffed. Um, yeah, so do I. Yeah. I, I. It's the same here. Yeah, it's incredible, right? You've got layoffs happening on one end, short-staffing happening uh, on, on another. And it's how do we optimize everyone that we have to get them more aligned more aligned, more productive, more fulfilled, more satisfied, more engaged and retained. And this, and, and so there's a step-by-step -step method in order to do that efficiently. So that piece also I wrote up as a book, which is also available on the website um, uh, under one of the tabs. So again, it's all there. It's just very hard to find these things, Bobby, because the world is so saturated with information. Even for me, I was going through this very crossroads, you know, crisscross pathway until I found these tools. And I've just brought it all together to make it simple and easy for people, if that makes sense. I would so encourage everybody listening to this to go to the website and go through this tool. I, you know, I cannot think of very many things. I was about to say, I can't think of anything, but I'm, I'm sure there are things that would trump this, but I can't think of many things that could be more important and make a greater impact on someone's life than finding their purpose and bliss. What is the mm. thing that makes me excited to get out of bed in the morning? What's the yeah. thing where I have to implement sleep strategies, not because of insomnia, but because mm. I am literally so excited about the day I have ahead of me tomorrow and the fact that I get to go to work or I get to bring that to life, meeting up with friends or sitting down with my family. I mean, that is it. When we talk about what people truly want out of life, they want yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you can sort of spot that in people who are living the Ikigai. You, there's a there's an energy about them. There's a vibrance there. There's a positivity, and it doesn't mean you you don't suffer. You know, it doesn't mean that you don't um, uh, have major major challenges. Because I think I have one kind of every other day <laughs> now. Because it, as you grow from this, you, you you start to realize. You know, like even yesterday we had this very big kind of deal that we were working on for two years, Bobby. You know, and it was five a.m. I woke up. You know, kind of read the email, I was like, it's going to be a hard stop, guys. We can't proceed. You know, it was like 5 a.m. in the morning, two years been working it out, and they said, oh, we can't proceed. Now, that would kind of shatter most CEOs or, you know, and just go, holy shit, you know. Uh, but when you have this sense of purpose and meaning, you just know you're going to get to where you want to go. Well, it's not, it's not just about the destination. It's about yeah. getting to take that journey. Yeah. It, it, it's because the, the, the outcomes are great. And, and when you miss them, they can be painful, sometimes yeah. devastating, but it's never really about that. It's like kids who play together and they're, they're totally immersed in play. It's not because one of them is going to win play for the day. It's because they get 
to actually play. Like when you Correct. love someone, you spend time with them. It's not because, oh, I'm trying to get the relationship to this point. No, this is the essence of the relationship. So I, I listened to Impact Theory, uh, Tom Bilyeu, and he said yeah. something He said something the other day that was just brilliant. He said that when he was, he was working on one part of developing one part of his company, his team got together and said, okay, let's do an exercise. What would we do? if we knew we could not fail. And that's kind of like cliche. It's a vision building yeah. question. Yeah, and right. he thought, oh, that's kind of stupid. That, that That's the wrong question. What would we do if we knew we could not fail? He's like, what would we do if we knew absolutely we were going to fail? We're just not, but we would do it anyway. What's yeah. so important to us that even if we knew yeah. ultimate failure was inevitable and permanent, we would still yeah. engage in this. I was like, oh, wow, that is smart. And when you talk yeah. about Ikigai, yeah. it, it, it's that thing. I would do it just to be able to do it because I, I love it so much. It's connected to my identity, to what's most yeah. meaningful. I yeah. cannot do otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, th I think for some people, you know, if they're sitting on the – you know, executive team, and they have the the power, they have the influence, if they have the access to a whole bunch of change makers, you know, that's certainly a vision that you can connect with. But, but how does an Ikigai also translate to um, the person that works in a job that they may not perceive as a leadership role? How does that translate to someone who's, you know, who may see themselves as a, I'm, I'm going to say lowly manager, if that's their self-perception, how does that relate to a mom or a dad or so on? Um, you know, I think the thing is um, when you are connected with your Ikigai and it's not purely related to your job, you become so much more present to um, every experience that you're experiencing every day, you know, whether the, the pain, the suffering, the joy and so on. And with all of that, whether you find meaning or not, um, when when you go through troubled times, are they in a relationship that you're having with your partner or child or so on and so forth, you, your sense of uh, duty as a mother, father, son, um, sibling, and so on, also helps you continue on the same kind of mindset mm -hmm. of journey of, you know, I'm here for a reason. Um, today, that reason is, uh, might be painful, but it, if I can keep just going on this journey, I'm I'm still in the right place. I'm in the perfect place to 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 do what I'm supposed to be doing, to change what I'm supposed to be changing. And part of that, I've often Bobby that that change is like a mirror. And I don't know if this is making any sense, but sometimes when you're going through that pain or when someone's experiencing um, a challenge, there's a lesson for you to learn in that very moment as well. They're really reflecting something within you. Um, I think about um, this is this goes a little bit deep into being present, but you can be so present that you know when you're a child, like, like I'm just going to talk about something really strange right now. But let's say racism, right? And let's say we 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 are so anti-racist, right? Um, and, and and there's a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that are out there at the moment. But even in our own journey, you see a child cannot recognize race when they first grow up. They just interact with children of all races uh, because they cannot recognize race. It's just not mentally comprehensible when you're that young. But at some point, that division starts to be recognized, right? And so when issues like that are coming up, can we look within ourselves and, and really go deep and go, is there something within me that's probably overemphasizing certain racial uh, distinctions or discriminations myself at that point in time so when you're in your ikigai you can ask yourself these questions you have the presence of mind to go deeper within yourself whereas if you're just going through the day-to-day -day meals and uh, numbing every stressful situation with alcohol toxins or entertainment or netflix or food you don't have that full presence to grow in that way does that make sense bobby you know, yes, it, it really does. I think it makes sense to 
a lot more people than just me. I think it makes sense to people who are listening to this. It's it's that it's that thing about being present and and having that compass to where a lot of times we're not present because of the stories we tell ourselves about what something means. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like it helps you reframe that the things that are happening to you yes. and, for, and for you around you in the moment, they're yes. not in the way they're on the way. Yeah. I know yeah. that you know. I I grew up in an extremely abusive household, and mm. you know, it, w- what I experienced was more along the lines of torture than it mm. was abuse. And everybody mm. wants to know, well, how would you overcome that? And you know, I'm not yeah. even sure if I if I completely have. And yeah. they're looking for an answer around mental toughness and a decision. And yeah. it, it really yeah. wasn't any of that. For me, yeah. it was Ikigai, where yeah. something emerged that was so important to me, that was so resonant yeah. with my identity and what gave me bliss, yeah. that I yeah. started to look at my situation and go, what's, what's valuable here? How do yeah. I use this? So everything, whether it was painful or intensely pleasurable, it became tools for me to build this yeah. construct in my environment so I can express yeah. ikigai. And, and I think that's, yeah. that, that's really powerful, that you can, you can be present. You don't have to distract yourself. When you, you also, when it comes to resilience, yeah. having a locus of control and predictability yeah. mitigates yeah. the stress response. And, and yeah. I, I think it's it's like, okay, well, I might not be in control of everything that's happening around me, but yes. li- living my ikigai, yeah. that is something I can choose to do. Now, the extent to which I can choose that might vary day to day, but I yes. can choose that. Like that yes. is my that is my true north. That is my yes. compass. Yes. Let everything change and be out of my control around me. This, this is resonant within me. Yeah. And I, I, it, it just, again, I, I think this is one of the most important things anyone can ever talk about. It is yeah. this, this sense of, of bliss and, and of, of purpose. I, I define yeah. purpose as when, you're you are living your highest values you're aware of what is most meaningful and you act mm. on that you express that in the world and when you express that in the world yeah it contributes to others not everybody yeah. but some people and when yeah. that connection between what's meaningful inside of me and how yeah. that actually touches you when i'm just going about acting on that yeah. that point of contact that touch that contribution yeah is what gives birth to purpose yeah you know yeah yeah no definitely and and i think the the bit that um i think a lot of people struggle with after they so first it's how do i know what it is how do i figure it out Mm -hmm. and obviously i mentioned you know there's the there's the the tool there the ikigai tools and so on and um, that you can use to kind of identify it in some of those areas it's how once I you know how do I know what I love doing well some of you may have done things that you love doing you might like listening to music or playing it but sometimes it's also um, what you love doing is isn't necessarily what you'd love doing if you did it all the time as a career mm. right um, so for example when I was a kid I used to love um soccer and football you know as you, and, <laughs> uh, you call it and and, and um but would I have loved doing it as a career I thought about it and I was like no I wouldn't like doing it as a career I wouldn't like managing football footballers either it's just that, wouldn't that's a really it. good example there's a lot right? of athletes probably end up there where they they loved it they they couldn't do anything else and then oh yeah, yeah. now it's now it's a job and it's like okay it, it frames it a little bit differently it frames it differently. So you've got to do the exercise of all the different bits. So what are your strengths? And sometimes there's technical skills as well, but there are other strengths that you identify as you 
go through this kind of process and there's tools like the you know the Gallup Clifton Strengths Finder and things like that that help you get clear there and there's a problem you want to solve in the world so what are you passionate who are you passionate about helping you know who's the you know are you passionate about you know helping solve hunger in Africa or are you helping sort of your organization um improve the quality of the you know the vegetables and meat industry in Australia and are you passionate about improving the care of others through health and well-being or personal fitness so there's all these different quadrants that help to map the different elements of you as a person mm-hmm. you know are you passionate about your children you know and kids so it's important to do all these different quadrants to really link all that together because that's really where you get to that delivering the highest value uh, for others as well I was talking to a uh, 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 someone, a former uh, customer is a you know corporate leader, and he's trying to find board members for his start. He's got lots of startups, and and he's trying to find board members for these startups. And he said, "I'm trying to struggle and trying to find these technical skills uh, for these board members." And I was thinking, well, you can find people like that. But I was also thinking to myself, what if you could find people whose ikigai was aligned to the mission and the purpose? of that company or that startup, how much further would they go to drive the success of those companies than someone who just had the technical skills and competencies that you need for that board? Does that make sense? In my experience, few things when you're selecting somebody for your team is more important. There, there There is a difference between someone who's performing just for an outcome right yeah. for the end result or compensation which is you know fine not judging that someone yeah. who is a complying versus someone who is completely on a when i say spiritual i'm talking about meaning emotional yeah. and mentally enrolled in yeah. the essence of what your company does you know, yeah th- that thank you for this this conversation everybody like go to the website like use this tool, figure out what that in quotes, it is for you that makes you feel most alive while you're living. Dr. Abby, thank you for being here. Really appreciate this and love the conversation. Bobby, thank you very much for your time. I really uh, appreciate it. I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested in connecting further. You can just as as Bobby mentioned, go to the website. We've got, you know, I've got a kind of inquiry button there that you can reach out to and I'm always really happy to hear from the community and what their feedback is and really help and support them in a way and thank you Bobby for all the amazing work that you do you you know like I mentioned the first time I met you you was already super inspired and you really energize people around you so again thank you for living your ikigai and making the world a better place as a result thank you Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.